thank you very much. My name is John Philip Sousa. And I'm delighted, hat here and all, I'm delighted to be here uh, returning from an appointment with uh, death. <laughs> all right, I admit it. My name is Owen Seward. This is not the famous Sousa band. This is the famous New Gardens band, famous for doing our right. <laughs> We are, uh, are doing our annual tribute to the great bandmaster. Uh, he was the most important, most famous musician of the early 20th century in America. In the late 1800s uh, into 1932, traveled the world over, and the legendary Sousa band is really the reason there are concert bands uh, today, because he made the concert band of uh, famous for what it is, which is a great performance ensemble. So tonight's performance will be in the style of John Philip Sousa. So return with us, except for microphones, <laughs> a, a return to a, a, with us to the olden days when we will play a Sousa concert just the way you would have heard it back in early 1900s. When the Sousa band train came to town, the town shut down. The businesses closed, the schools closed. Everyone came out to hear the famous Sousa Band. And it was a, a memorable experience. I've had the privilege of talking to a lot of people from uh, our area here, from around the country, who have told me that when they were children, little children, they remember vividly having an opportunity. Their parents took them to hear the famous Sousa Band. It was, in fact, a major occasion. So the Sousa band played classical music, uh, and that was uh, sometimes a surprise. It may be a surprise to you. Uh, they introduced audiences in America to the classics, and people hadn't even uh, heard of symphony orchestra in the United States. There were only three uh, in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. They were only three orchestras in the United States during that time. So he brought much of the music of the classics to the audience. One of his favorite composers was von Suppe, Franz von Suppe, who wrote these wonderful overtures that usually had uh, chases in the middle of them. In this case, we'll hear a trumpet fanfare followed by a horse chase. You'll hear the horse's whoops as they rattle down the road. And, uh, uh, a grand climax where everybody's racing to the finish. Now, a word about your program. Your program says that we are playing the Light uh, Cavalry Overture. At the end of that overture, the audiences were over joyously applauding. <laughs> now, that is our cue than to play an encore. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Here is uh, Franz von Suppe's Light Cavalry Overture.
Seventh March was just one of 135 marches that the great John Philip Sousa wrote. He was uh, famous for his marches and thus called the March King. You'll get to hear a half a dozen of his famous marches tonight. One time, uh, an audience member wrote to me and said, would you please just do an all night of John Philip Sousa marches? And that's what the band said. <laughs> <laughs> they're difficult and they're very taxing. Uh, in addition to Sousa himself being famous, he carried with him some superstars. He had recruited from the major orchestras whose seasons were over uh, to go out on tour during the summer. Sousa recruited those people. Many of those musicians at first would say to Sousa, uh, well, it's, it's really, I'm a classical uh, performer and it's really below me to go out and play with a concert band. Thank you very much anyway. And uh, Sousa would say, well, yes, but I'm going to pay you twice as much as Philadelphia Orchestra paid you. Mm -hmm. And the musicians would say, uh, what time do I show up? <laughs> <laughs> Among them was the great Herbert L. Clark. He was one of the superstars along with Arthur Pryor, two great soloists that would be featured on almost every concert. Herbert Clark played over 10,000 concerts with the Sousa Band as their soloist. He wrote a number of pieces just to showcase his talents. And uh, he was sponsored by the Kahn Trumpet Company, by the way, Cornet Company. Mothers would come up uh, to the train after the concert and introduce their son to Herbert Clark and say, how can I get my son to play like I can play? And Herbert Clark would say, what you need, ma'am, is this very cornet that I play. <laughs> and he was selling his cornet, his one and only personal cornet. <laughs> and then he would get on the train and pick down another one. <laughs> they say that he carried as many as 50 horns with him on the train. And that model became one of the flute players in the Sousa Band's model for writing a musical called The Music Man. Wow. Meredith Wilson was a flute player in the Sousa Band and he saw that going on and recognized that Professor Harold Hill would make a good story. <laughs> we have our own Herbert L. Clark. We're delighted uh, there's a new gentleman who's just moved to this region and he's gonna be one of the gifts to music in this area. He's a very fine trumpeter, a very fine teacher in Martin County. His name is Ben Hilton, he comes from the Carolinas, and uh, we're delighted to have him tonight to play one of Herbert Clark's favorite pieces, Made of the Mist, which if you're thinking you've heard that name before, that's the title of the boat that goes underneath the Niagara Falls. <laughs> So uh, please welcome Ben Hilton to play Made of the Mist.
great, we were talking backstage before the show. Uh, we, we live in a musically rich area. We have a lot of people who come from different parts of the country and moved out here. They're very, very talented people. And we're delighted to have uh, new, rich talent like that moving into the area. You recognize Ben as being one of the trumpet players in our sister group, the uh, Indian River Pops Orchestra. Mr. Sousa knew other composers. He corresponded on a regular basis and met a couple of times with Camille Saint-Saëns. He was very, very fond of the music of Richard Wagner and introduced American audiences to Wagner. They hadn't heard Wagner played and the Sousa band played it for them. He was very aware of movements of music that were going on. In the late 1890s, the French Impressionist movement was coming in and Claude Debussy was writing pieces such as the one you're about to hear, which is the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. Now that is based on a poem by the same name, Prelude d'un poème de Dieu le fawn. And uh, it is just letting yourself go and imagining being a little fawn in the woods. It's that easy. Here is WC's Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fall.
great regrets was that his operettas, his art songs, and his suites of pieces were not well received. And uh, it frustrated him that he was always remembered for his marches. But that he got over that quite often whenever the checks came in the mail. <laughs> One of the suites that he wrote was Dwellers of the Western World. If that were published today, uh, the author would be run out of town. Uh, one of the obvious titles of this movement is The Red Man. I need not tell you what some of the other movements titles are. Uh, in a day and age where we live with everyone being offended about everything, uh, this would hardly fly in today's world, but this is 1890s. This is the beginning of the great Edison invention called the motion picture, and the silent movies were becoming king, and Sousa saw that. He saw that coming, and he wanted to be part of that never for a moment thinking that they might have sound with those someday in 1928. So when you hear this movement from dwellers of the Western world called Red Man, you can, in your mind, picture a silent movie involving Indians, and of course you know what usually happened to them in the early films. So here is the Red Man from dwellers of the Western world.
Cadets became uh, a school song for many, many high schools all over the United States, uh, beginning in the 1930s and 40s, when the school band movement began to, to take hold in America. Uh, a movement which I hope we can continue. We have uh, among us a number of very talented high school band directors uh, sitting right in here. In fact, they had a band festival that lasted until 5.30 in Sebastian and made it down here to sit on the stage and play tonight. So, uh, and then if you were listening in the Red Man, you heard, oh, 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 oh. oh yeah, Florida State, there you go. Now the Indians are offended. <laughs> FAU has the owl. Now the owls are endangered. And now they've named their stadium after a prison. <laughs> I don't know. Now the prisoners are offended. <laughs> uh, you can't win. You can't win. We're going to play John Philip Sousa's most famous march next. Uh, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> it is not the Stars and Stripes Forever. That became his favorite later on. During his lifetime, one of the first marches he ever wrote called the Washington Post March, dedicated to the newspaper in Washington, D.C., who purchased it from him for the sum of $35 <laughs> and made a great deal of money on it built several buildings with the money, royalties from that, and taught Mr. Sousa a very important lesson. But this march came along at just the right time because the waltz was falling out of favor and a new dance called the two-step or foxtrot was coming into play. And the Washington Post march became so popular that it took on its own dance title. And there are still some silent movies that you can see the people dancing to a dance called the Washington Post. So we're gonna round out the first half of our program tonight with John Philip Sousa's favorite march. It was his favorite even though he got roped on the deal. And uh, one of the most popular while he was alive, the Washington Post March. Thank you. 